Uh, over the years, I, I received an appreciable. Can you hear me? I received an appreciable amount of mail uh, from students, professors, uh, and the educated public about one aspect or another uh, of the books I've been involved in. Uh, the relativity text, for example, uh, brings a call for help with the so-called paradoxes uh, and a good deal of crank material, I must say, too. Uh, other books have brought their share of letters, and there's a little rise now with the quantum physics book, which I and I introduced, uh, is taking hold. But the heaviest volume of mail that uh, I get is connected uh, with uh, the two volumes of physics, which David and Halliday and I co-authored. Uh, I would say since 1960, I've gotten perhaps 2,500 letters, maybe three a week is the average over those 17 years, in connection uh, with one aspect or another of the book. So I find that physicists are most interested in hearing about that, uh, probably because of its widespread use uh, throughout the world. So I'm going to find my remarks uh, being an author just to those books. Now, uh, those. Uh, Physics for Engineer books, uh, as called that originally, had its origin in my being a lecturer in an engineering physics course at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, there were marvelous lecture demonstrations there, which uh, Oswald, Blackwood, and Bill Kelly, some of you may know the other thing, had created. And it was very easy for me to be uh, a real ham as a lecturer. At the same time, you know, a real showman. Uh, but at the same time, I tried to present the physics there with a clarity and a depth that I thought was lacking in the books that we used at the time. Uh, and even in the advanced courses in atomic and nuclear physics, for whatever reason, probably because I was young and full of vigor, uh, the students seemed to be turned on, and I soon developed a religious fervor, which you have to do to get into this field, developed a kind of religious fervor about what was wrong with the teaching of physics at all levels. And before you know it, that led me into AAPT meetings and conferences. And it was at some national meeting when I met Walter Michaels, who was soon to become the president of the AAPT and give it one of the most dynamic presidencies it ever had. And, and he pretty much told me that, you know, put my money where my mouth is and write a book if things are so bad. So uh, came back home to Pitt, and there was a talented chairman, David Halliday, whom I informed that I was going to write an introductory physics book to. And soon I found out that he was thinking of writing an atomic physics book. He had just completed a successful nuclear one. Some of you can remember that, I think. And it didn't take long before we decided, well, we'll work together. First, we'll do the general physics book, and then we'll do the atomic physics book. To this day, we haven't done that atomic physics book. <laughs> well, publishers heard this almost at once, and they came from all over. But only a very few were so interested, and really, so believing that we would do anything, that they would be willing to offer us a contract without a single word having yet been written. And that's what happened. It turns out that the editors at John Wiley and Sons had been under intense pressure from management to come up with a book in engineering physics that would sell. That's the way they put it. <laughs> so they gambled on us. Your ideas and the glint in your eyes was enough for them. Well, considering that it took nearly five years, 1955 to 1960, to publish that book, uh, I sometimes feel that we never would have finished if it hadn't been for the commitment that the contract represented and the support that it represented. Uh, starting from scratch and ending with about 1,350 published pages uh, it isn't just like falling off a log, and you need a lot more than idealism to get through there. And the fact that I'm reminded here, and I always tell this that at this point, I'm reminded of the story uh, of the town councilors in Pisa, Italy, voting to put a clock up at the top of the leading tower. And when the reporters asked them why they did such a thing, one counselor said, what's the sense of having the inclination if you don't have the time? <laughs> 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 so we made the time. But with so many other opportunities pushed aside in favor of the book, I soon found my religious fervor subsiding somewhat, and I have to admit that occasionally I said to myself, boy, this book had better sell. <laughs> well, what were our ideas? Uh, I bring this up only because it helps in part to answer the question that I'm frequently asked. Why was the book such a success? And, of course, the real truth is that we were just plain lucky. I mean that seriously. But I can't resist trying to identify with the mood of Lord Rutherford who wrote in a letter late in life as follows, 
I've just been reading some of my early papers. And you know, when I finished, I said to myself, Rutherford, my boy, you used to be a damn clever fellow. <laughs> and so in retrospect, the 2020 hindsight is now clear to me that we were damn clever fellows. <laughs> First of all, uh, we were not revolutionary unless a commitment to quality can be so regarded. But we were teaching engineering and science students, after all, and did not feel that we needed any particular gimmicks to get them interested. We also believed that a sound foundation in Newtonian and Maxwellian ideas was not only important for its own right, but that that was the only proper way to get the correct foundation to teach modern physics. So whether this happened uh, not to contradict the inertia or the conservatism or the lack of familiarity with modern physics, that characterized much of general physics instruction at that time in the late 50s, according to some people, or whether it in fact represented the best possible pedagogy, namely the natural growth of physical ideas, which they and I believe. In any case, it made our book accessible to everyone and it was a realistic goal to aim for. Well, what do we plan to do after reaching that basic decision? And I guess to put it most generally, I can say that we sought to broaden the view and deepen the intellectual content of physics at the introductory level. And here I'm going to be serious for a while because you are teachers, and uh, I do try to answer that question that may have some lessons for the present scene. Uh, amongst the score of ways that we aim to achieve that, I can cite a few. For example, stripping down the large number of topics presented in the usual encyclopedic coverage of physics and replacing that by a more expansive treatment and a deeper understanding of fewer topics. Systematically modernizing the applications of classical topics. That is not to say bringing modern physics in, but modernizing the applications of classical physics. Trying to break down the compartmentalization of the subject, mechanics, heat, light, sound, electricity, magnetism, and so forth, and emphasizing instead its unity by stressing analogies and common principles, such as the conservation laws, wave concepts, resonance ideas, which exist throughout all of those compartments. And finally, replacing the highly deductive treatment uh, of physics, which was very common at the time, by a greater stress on the relation between theory and experiment. So we sensed that the objective conditions were evolving at that time, and I'll get to the present eventually. But at that time, the conditions were evolving that made such a treatment feasible and desirable. Namely, the increasing recognition of the importance of physics for its own sake to engineering and to other sciences, the rapidly increasing population of physics faculties at that time with new young PhDs who were gaining a voice in the introductory courses, and the rising standards in the mathematical preparation of the students. And we hoped that a book such as ours would be in tune with and could help to accelerate such trends. Well, shortly after the writing started, I was enticed away to Rensselaer. That's discovery in its own right. Nevertheless, that was a decisive move in guaranteeing the success of the book, in my opinion, and they've helped these too. To be sure, the ideas, the judgment, the skills, the drive of the authors is primary in any book, uh, good or bad. But the circumstances at Rensselaer provided an environment and a testing ground that permitted the flowering of those qualities. It, it's one thing, and it's very important, to have an accessible pedagogic strategy, and uh, it's also important to have good plans uh, specific plans for change that are in tune with developing trends. But all that's theoretical. You still have to carry it all out and in great detail. Now, every science and engineering student at Rensselaer took a four-semester introductory course. Remember those days? Four-semester introductory physics course that involved the entire physics faculty in one way or another. And I was encouraged to get and was successful in getting foundation and institute support for a complete revision of that course along the lines of my reform proposals. So, in the context of designing new lecture demonstrations and new laboratory experiments and new audio-visual techniques, the text notes were steadily prepared, produced, and tested under fire for three successive years. Although the notes were being used at Pitt also, Dave and I agreed that Rensselaer would be the control. The student body there was a cut or two above what I'd encountered anywhere before, both in interest uh, and in ability, and the Hawthorne effect was at work. It's those of you who are teaching know, namely, the consciousness of taking part in a major reform program raised the participation and enthusiasm of everyone. Well, Dave and I kept on in touch through the mails, telephone, meetings at the publishers, uh, at national professional society meetings, and we really paid attention to student reaction. I think that was critical. 
Often we would argue about the simplest possible explanation of some effect. <coughs> and we learned that nature doesn't always yield to simple interpretations. Introductory textbook authors who want to present physics in such a way that nothing has to be unlearned in a more advanced course, and who at the same time are trying to keep things relatively simple, have the same problem as that which faces theorists who are trying to explain the latest experimental results. And it's aptly summarized by the story of the experimentalist who meets his theorist friend one morning and says, boy, I'm really tired, but at least last night I got data that definitely proved A is greater than B. Oh, said the theorist, it's easy to explain why A is greater than B. Well, wait a minute, said the experimentalist, did I say A greater than B? I meant to say B greater than A. Well, said the theorist, in that case, it's even easier to explain. <laughs> <laughs> well, we went through three years of intensive classroom trials at Rensselaer, and these trials perfected the textbook. They set the level above the then existing national norm, but the national tide was clearly coming along then, and in fact, it not only caught up, but in some places it went way beyond. But at the time, critics felt that our level was much too high to be realistic. But the trials guaranteed the quality of the material, as you know how you have to do that allowing us to pay attention to detail, polishing the physics, perfecting the goals, and a quality that would eventually give the book a staying power once it got used and reused. And the trials enable us to use our planned expansive writing to clear up all sorts of pedagogic hurdles, student difficulties, to build up the number and quality of examples and figures and tables and questions and problems and all those teaching aids which are crucial in, in making a whole system work. In short, then, we were able to produce a book that was in tune not only with rising standards and developing trends in physics, but also with a need that was then emerging from the rapid growth of mass education in the 60s, namely less dependence on instructors and a greater dependence on self-study by students. To be sure, the trials could have led to confusion and maybe even to disaster if the authors didn't have the judgment to reject a good deal of well-intentioned advice, to know how to cope with contradictory criticisms and to stick to and know how to carry out the initial goals. Now it is a fact that not one of the five external reviews commissioned by the publishers before the book was published was favorable. Everyone was unfavorable. <laughs> Reviewers really did not see much merit in the book at all when they tested it against the needs that they perceived. And this in spite of our three years of testing and trials. Indeed, we learned later that it was only on the advice of Bob Sproul, who's now president of the University of Rochester, but was then a wily consultant and a physics author in his own right, that the firm decided to ignore all of those reviews and go ahead and publish the book the way David Halliday and I insisted it should be done. <laughs> so we now know the outcome of all that. All that work was not in vain. Okay, now the book took off right from the start. And you'd think that recognition from publishers or students or colleagues in the field might follow this success, but it wasn't to be. Consider some of these items, various number of years down the line. One and a half years after publication, the president of a really very well-known New York publishing house that will remain nameless, personally signed letter, writes to me, Dear Professor Rennick, first of all, he doesn't even get my name right, you see. <laughs> We have the pleasure of informing you that we contemplate the publication of an introductory textbook in the field of physics. The book should be a fresh individual approach to the teaching of this subject. And we would be happy if you could consider to write or cooperate in the writing of such a work. Well, you know, I don't know what provoked his letter, whether he never heard of our book at all. Or he was suddenly giving me his opinion of it. But I thought that's what I just finished doing for the last five years. Well, two and a half years after publication, a professor of physics at a school that had been using our book writes as follows. Dear Professor Resnick, recently I read a statement to the effect that teachers remember textbooks by name of authors, whereas students remember the color of their covers. Determined to test this for myself, I asked our students in engineering physics to name the authors and the color of their physics text on a recent examination. I thought you might be interested in some data on the transient nature of an author's fame. <laughs> Only about 36% of the class knew the names of the authors, or any reasonable facsimile, but over 95% knew the color of the book. There is a possibility that the other 5% were confused by our using two editions simultaneously. <laughs> but whether it was because of the press of time during the exam, 
or the typical engineer's disregard for linguistic precision, some renderings of the author's names came through with an amusing variety of spellings. And now I don't know if anyone's back there at the slides, but I would like to have the first slide. Now, let me take these one at a time. Halloway and Resnack. <laughs> this student may have skipped lunch. <laughs> Halliday and Resnick, possibly related to arsenic. <laughs> Holiday and Resnick. This test was just after Christmas vacation. <laughs> Halliday and Residay. <laughs> My favorite. It has a certain swing. <laughs> Holiday and Ren Sick. <laughs> How I felt there for grading the test. <laughs> well, that's enough of that. Slide. There were several last ditch efforts by students who memorized only essentials, that is H and R. The class politician, though, was taking no chances. His last name begins with R, and he is a very smart and intelligent man. Which I can only say, no comment. <laughs> we don't need the slide now, we'll turn it off. Well, now consider this, nine years after publication. <laughs> <laughs> Nine years after publication, actual sales were about 900,000 at that point, and the book now in a second edition was already translated into a dozen or more foreign languages. And all this apart from the Formosa Nationalist Chinese distribution of probably 100,000 copies of so-called pirated editions in English and in Chinese all over the world. There was a visiting Soviet professor of physics at Rensselaer. Uh, privately, my pride had been hurt that the Russians hadn't seen fit to pirate our book. <laughs> Neither the USSR nor Nationalist China were part of the International Copyright Agreement, you know. And a lot of pirating of Soviet books uh, went on by American publishers, too. Well, after I got to know and like our Soviet visitor, I brought him copies of the book and I asked him to accept them with my compliments. And he refused. He said, we already have translated the best American introductory physics books, as if to say, who needs yours? <laughs> oh, oh, is that so? You know, I, I muttered, he said, yes, we have a book by a student of Fermi's. And I thought for a while and said, oh, you must mean Jay O'Rear's book, because Jay was a student of Fermi's. And he said, a student of Fermi's. I don't think he ever heard of O'Rear either. <laughs> well, I left the Vince block. A week later, as fate decreed, I received a letter from a West German dealer who keeps up on Soviet publications. <coughs> Dear Mr. Resnick, according to the Soviet weekly book catalog, Novi Knigi SSSR number 12, a book which you wrote entitled Physics has been translated into Russian and is scheduled to be published by the Prozveshnya Publishing House in Moscow sometime in the third quarter of 1969. If you have any interest in obtaining a copy of the Russian version, perhaps we could be of service to you in procuring it. And enclosed was a catalog description in Russian of that book. Well, I can't read Russian, so I took the description to my Soviet visitor and asked his assistance in translating it. As he read it off to me, very quickly, he then slowed down a bit, and he looked up at me and pointed his finger and said, You? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I said. I wrote down the translation and thanked him. And ten days later, just before our visitor's departure from the States, one of my colleagues came to me in a rush to get desk copies of my books. He said he ran out of them, and his Russian visitor had just asked him, please get copies so he could take them back to the Soviet Union. Well, this general question of recognition and reputation took a very strange twist during my sabbatical year at Harvard. I was really there primarily uh, to concentrate on finishing the second edition of physics, but Jerry Holton, who had invited me there, truly housed me in the Harvard Project Physics bullpen, where I was sure to get involved with that project. Now, actually, I was very pleased to do that. I shared a lot of his goals and interests and met some marvelous people. But between that and the normal distractions of Harvard and Cambridge, my revision timetable was just falling apart. Oh, I was walking through Harvard Square thinking that I really should get back to work on a revision when I was distracted by a bookstore. You know, one thing or another would distract me up there. And browsing around inside, I noticed a big sign, Use Textbooks Downstairs. So I went down. And in the physics section, I found every conceivable introductory physics text. But even though uh, our book was being used at Harvard, there wasn't a trace of Resnick and Halliday to be found. And this naturally aroused my curiosity. So I sought out the manager, who had no idea who I was, and I said, how come there's no used copy of Resnick and Halliday? Oh, he said, we would never stock that. Why not, I said. 
And then he looked at me with a smug, knowing air. Don't you know they're coming out with a new edition any day now? <laughs> well, even though there was no possible way of getting that book out in less than 15 or 16 months hence, when I left that store, I sort of said to myself, if he has that much confidence in our vision, I surely shouldn't doubt it myself. And from that moment on, I really poured out the work and actually caught up the schedule. Well, perhaps I should say that after many intervening years, during which time I worked on many other books, either on my own or with other co-authors or as a member of long-term physics education projects, Dave Halliday, who took a detour into administration for 10 years, anyhow, Dave Halliday and I are happily working together again, and we're now completing the third edition of physics. And I hope the bookstores get wind of that one. <laughs> well, of course, the situation today in physics instruction is obviously not the same as it was in the 60s. Uh, reflecting the relative decline in the importance of physics courses to <laughs> curriculum planners in other areas of science or engineering, introductory physics courses have become shorter, uh, more optional. Uh, the student audience is less captive and more critical. The physics faculties are not growing larger in numbers, nor younger in mean age. The trends in mathematics and even the demographic situation are different. To be sure, some material required before now becomes optional. The applied and the humanistic features receive somewhat more emphasis than before. And connections to other disciplines are made more explicit. But it's still true that the natural growth of physical ideas represent the best pedagogy. That breadth still comes from depth. That quality is still necessary for long-term survival. That genuine classroom testing still counts for much. And textbooks that are their own study guides work the best. Well, I referred earlier to the large number of letters I received. Before long, I had to start categorizing them. And one interesting category is the I want to help you letter. For example, dear Mr. Resnick, in your book Physics, there are numerous mistakes, or at least a lack of clarity in your explanations of conservation of linear momentum, conservation of angular momentum, and conservation of energy. I will dwell on the most obvious, and after hearing your, your reply, we can proceed from there. <laughs> well, having put me down, he then proceeds to straighten me out with specifics. And this is typical of such letters, but what was special about this one was his postscript, P.S. I am in an astronautics group, and the theory here is going to have an important bearing on rendezvous in Project Gemini. We anxiously await your reply. Well, I certainly didn't want to slow down the space program. <laughs> uh, so I wrote him a detailed explanation of just where he went wrong and why the book is right. And back came his reply, essentially ignoring my comments, repeating his original conclusions, and raising still more questions for me to answer. Well, at that point, I saw a correspondence course developing, which is a not uncommon danger for textbook authors. And I rationalized that somehow Project Gemini would work out without my assistance. And you know it did. <laughs> well, another category is the will you help me letter. I want serious ones there. Dear Professor Resnick, my son John, a student at Ohio University, has enrolled in a physics class which uses your textbook physics. My son is blind and must have his textbooks recorded on tape. We would be most grateful for any assistance you could give us as John is an A student in mathematics and is most anxious to take his course. So it was with a great deal of satisfaction that he was able to get the publisher to turn over the rights to have the book put on tape and in Braille and to carry that out successfully. But most of the letters in the category of will you help me are of a different kind. For example, dear Professor Resnick, I am a design engineer with Blank Blank Corporation and have recently come across your two volumes of physics while browsing through the bookstore. I must say that they are a far cry from the old houseman and slack that I took years ago. After showing the books to some of the fellows at work, they have obtained copies and some interesting questions develop. These questions not only develop at work, but my wife is interested in knowing the answer to the question on the lazy Susan and the little cockroach of Mass M. Next slide. No, one more thing. That's it. Uh, cockroach on lazy Susan at rest. Breadcrumb at rest. Herschel brain. He goes after the breadcrumb. I told her that the table must stop when the roach stops to eat the breadcrumb. But she doesn't believe it. 
Perhaps I'm wrong. I'm sure I'm correct. Will you please write to my wife? <laughs> then I had the chance to combine two categories. The, will you help me with, I want to help you. I got a letter from some student in Singapore telling me that he had my book in English and in Chinese, and the fact that he got them from Formosa, or I guess it is Xerox, and, uh, I didn't, that was the first I heard that it was in Chinese. It took me years to get a copy of that. And not only that, but he had the solutions to all the problems in Chinese. But could I help him by sending him the sol all the solutions to the problems in English? <laughs> well, I don't even have the solutions to all the problems myself, you know. But within two weeks of that, I got a letter from a professor in California saying, Dear Professor Resnick, I want you to see the enclosed thing. And enclosed was a big ad. Get the solutions to all the problems in Resnick and Halliday. Part one, $30. Part two, $30. Send check to so-and-so. Uh, well, the book's been out a long time, and some bright students just put all the answers and solutions together, and they were selling it. So that was easy. I took care of both letters by just sending that copy to my friend in Singapore. <laughs> both things. <laughs> now, I'm not really sure how to categorize this letter. Dear Bob Red, recently I happened, you can tell as a friend, recently I happened to read problem 20, page 208 of Resnick and Halliday Physics, part one, about N men jumping from one end of a flat car at a speed of V rel relative to the flat car. And I was ashamed to find that it was not obvious whether the car would reach a higher final speed if the men jumped off sequentially. So I brought the matter up at our Cambridge Electron Accelerator lunch a week ago at Harvard with 12 PhDs in physics present. And all of them except me claimed that the answer was no. That is, it doesn't matter if the men jump sequentially or at the same time. Worse, they all claimed that the answer was obvious. <laughs> so I thought about the matter a bit at home that evening and I soon realized that the answer is yes. Next slide. The next slide will, sh will show the, the situation that they're jumping off sequentially or all at once. I realized the answer is yes. So I wrote up a small proof. Slide. Next slide. Yes, Virginia, there is a difference. <laughs> posted it on a bullet board and I let the men read it and I then sounded them out further about it. To my horror, most of them still claimed that the answer was no. Instead of paying attention to my little proof, they preferred to present long equations filled with mistakes proving that they were right. <laughs> but a happy ending. Each day since then, one or two of these men had slunk into my office to confess that I was right. <laughs> the final speed of the car is greater if the men jump off sequentially. And then he concludes the letter, I hope you agree. <laughs> the impression, I must add, that many letters and calls are very complimentary, and a fair number of them, if not directly, and at least indirectly, have taught me something about physics or how to teach it. Indeed, these letters, and happenings helped the publisher at a time of frustration. In 1970, when the sales had passed the million mark, the Wiley editorial group sought to get a thoughtful article published in a trade journal or a business or management magazine, something of that sort, reporting in a professional way on this phenomenon in a book that their reviewers had rejected and goes on to such success. But everywhere, they were turned down. Well, one day my wife and I got a call from the third cousin of hers who had recently returned from his European assignment as correspondent for Time and Life magazine. Remember those? Uh, he's now, he was now writing for the New York Times on literary and intellectual affairs, and he was about to take a trip to nearby Bennington College in Vermont and thought that he'd renew acquaintances by stopping in to see us. Well, I had just returned from a meeting of the Commission on College Physics. And all sorts of science and society issues had come up there, such as the role of women in science, the anti-rational trend amongst students, and so forth. So that when he came, the talk drifted to all of those matters. But nothing moved him until I showed him some of the letters that I get about my books. And that did it. Before I knew it, he had a story that his editor wanted to make an entire half-page spread on. So, next slide. In the August of 1971, there was a story entitled The Great Eggplant, 
grows into a popular academic success in the New York Times, better and more public than the firm could ever have hoped for. Next slide. It even made the international edition of the Herald Tribune under the title, The Colors of Physics. Now let me read you the opening paragraph. The great eggplant is what David Halliday and Robert Esnick, see I don't have my name straight either, co-authors <laughs> of physics call their wildly successful textbook a purple bound tome of 1,324 pages. Squeeze down to 817 pages in an alternative edition entitled Fundamentals of Physics and bound in orange, the text is called The Great Pumpkin. A planned revision to be bound in red has inevitably been dubbed the Great Red Pepper. As sure as anything can be in precarious publishing fields, the authors will never be caught with a lemon on their hands. Well, what the writer didn't know, and uh, I can reveal to you now, is just how these names came about. Uh, it took years for the publisher to convince us that an abbreviated version of physics would be a service to the profession at all. Uh, and year after year passed with Don Denick, physics editor, waiting for a manuscript from us, and the manuscript never appeared. So then he started to feel like Linus in the Charles Schultz Peanuts cartoon, waiting bravely and hopefully every year at Halloween for the great pumpkin to appear. <laughs> so when the manuscript finally did appear, it naturally just had to be orange, and it was called the great pumpkin. <laughs> then in retrospect, the original purple opus had to have a name, so we called it the eggplant. And we were off to the vegetarian coloring game. The first thing we do now in planning a book is to pick the color and the plant that corresponds. <laughs> the revised edition of Fundamentals is a greenish yellow, and we call it the big banana. But when I hesitated about that choice, I still not sure I like that, and I told my editor that a lemon has the same color, he said, well, either way, you have a book with a peel. <laughs> Well, not every publishing barrier is so easily or luckily penetrated. An exam in modern physics that a colleague and I cast in limerick form, the student must fill in the couplet or else the last line. That exam has become part of the underground literature of physics instruction. Countless editors, it seems, backed off from publishing it at the last minute. The exam is about physics, and it's even literary. But apparently, in the eyes of the reader, it's too suggestive for him to take seriously even though it's meant to be taken seriously. Here are a few test items. Next slide. An atom that came from the tap and electrons all over her map. But in her interstices lurked a much worse disease. Da -da 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 -da. That refers to radioactive decay of the nucleus, of course. Um, next slide. Set a slow little neutron ear of vision don't speak of me with such derision. I may have no charge and not be so large. Da -da 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 -da. That refers to nuclear forces and fission and so forth. Or, uh, let me sneak, all right, uh, I'll sneak one in before that. When a smart little wave named Swoon found a particle up in her room, she remembered De Broly and the scriptures so holy. Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> that refers to the wave particle duality. <laughs> or the one that's up there now, an electron that was quite debonair, spied a positron up on the stair. Da 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 da, -da, -da and finished him off in midair. <laughs> that refers to air annihilation. <laughs> so all these are serious. Perhaps I should tell you the sort of legitimate answers I had in mind. If you believe that. Um, on this one, for example, Remembering that the electron and the positron circle about their common center of mass forming a short-lived positronium atom before a mutual annihilation, the student might have used a couplet in there like, starting the death dance, she put him in a trance, or today an incorrect answer, for which I guess you get part credit, might be, she meant him no harm, but turned on her charm and finished him. <laughs> <laughs> so it goes. <laughs> Well, that bit of limericks even played a role when David Halliday uh, retired prematurely, that is, at an early age, from uh, the University of Pittsburgh in order to concentrate on writing. Uh, he's up in the, uh, let's assume that Halliday exists, and he's up in, the, uh, in Dartmouth Way. 
and they were giving a, a retirement dinner for him that I was not able to attend, unfortunately. So I wrote a long letter in part of that letter, which was to be read there, it reads as follows. Naturally, Miller and I are unhappy at missing such a pleasant way to renew old friendships with others, and this would have given me a golden opportunity to roast they. You know, I have all my students convinced that Halliday doesn't really exist. After all, they're too young to know about all those books they wrote before I came to Pitt, and I don't dare invite him to give a colloquium talk here to shatter the illusion I foster. An author named Bob, a knave, invented a co-author named Dave. Said he, it's a shame to share all that fame, but think of the taxes I save. <laughs> yep, in this period of the so-called post watergate morality, they still believe that I invented a tax write-off. <laughs> that keeps my fame intact, and it's sort of having your cake and eating it too. Well, Dave's no slouch, as you can guess, and I got a long reply back from him, but his letter on that thing says, I'd like to respond to your first limerick with, they say that Bob won Erstead's prize. It really was me in disguise. For I dreamed up Bob to convince all the mob the arrangement is just otherwise. <laughs> we had fun. Well, I recited here some real but amusing happenings of a textbook author, knowing that there's really much truth revealed in jest. You'll understand that I'm somewhat skeptical of reviewers, but that my skin, now grown thicker, is still sensitive to critics, and that along with a confidence in my own judgment, there has grown a humility about what has really been accomplished after all, and that I believe that a sense of humor and a somewhat irreverent attitude help one to cope with it all. But most encouraging have been many letters of expressions of praise and thanks uh, that I received, and I've had an awful lot of recognition and credit cast upon me, for which I'm truly grateful. But the truth is that it has been the students in the whole spectrum of courses that I've taught over the years uh, who always would motivate me. They were the ones who challenged me, from the bored ones to the brilliant ones. And sometimes that was the characteristic of the very same student. Uh, I have to pay special tribute to them, and it's one reason I give the Rensselaer students so much credit here. By being receptive to their ideas and sensitive to their moods, I've learned an awful lot from them about the teaching of physics. And they, I feel, deserve much of the credit that has been given to me. Thank you. That's all I have to say.